going crazy. They're jumping on each other. One of the most unbelievable finishes you will ever see. Welcome to it, another edition of Magic Moments, Brett Hollander and Jeff Arnold. And we're going to soon talk to former Oriole Steve Pierce about the 2014 AL East clinching game for the Orioles against the Toronto Blue Jays. And Jeff, first of all, let's talk about Pierce. What an interesting guy and what an interesting career. You want to talk about someone who bounced around but yet had so many big baseball moments, including many with his 2014 Orioles team. I mean, you don't hear about too many players that accrue 10 years of big league service time when for the first, I don't know, six, seven, eight years of his, of his career, he didn't even play 100 games. I mean, it's hard to stick around for as long as he did. He started with the Pirates. I mean, he was up and down, and it, it took him a while to build up some momentum, and it was – you know, that 2014 season, which was was kind of the year for him where he set career highs in a bunch of different categories. He played all across the field and, and kept him around. And it was good that he was around because the Orioles that year, they had a, a lot of guys that, that they were really relying upon that, you know, were, you know, Machado was dealing with an injury. Chris Davis had the, the situation that he was dealing with. Uh, there were all kinds of different things that came up. And so the Orioles relied on a bunch of their role players. Pierce was one of them, and he produced in a huge way that was pivotal to that 2014 team. Yeah, that O's run, they had a lot of perennial all-stars, obviously a lot of good players. But to me, guys like Steve Pierce were kind of the symbol of the glue and finding a new hero every night. And that's really the role they were in. I mean, 2014, it almost got bizarre at the time. They pick up guys like Alejandro Deaza or Kelly Johnson down the stretch. And all of a sudden, those guys were hitting the walk-offs. And it almost, like, didn't make any sense. But every button they pushed was the right button. But Pierce had a big year that year. 21 home runs, homer on the clinching night, a homer twice the next day. But he was someone who, as you said, Jeff, played around. The Orioles, you know, you saw flashes of it the, uh, a few years prior. He, You know, maybe he was playing against left-handed pitching. Maybe he'd come up as a pinch hitter. Uh, but still someone, if you look at his transaction chart, Jeff, something I know you've had to deal with a lot in your career uh, <laughs> when it comes to monitoring players. I mean, it's on and off rosters almost by the day uh, for a guy like Steve Pierce until he found kind of a home with the Baltimore Orioles. And he got an opportunity, and boy, did he take advantage of it. And that was probably the reason why he put up the numbers that he did. It's very hard to put consistent production together when you are serving as a pinch hitter, you're playing every third day, or the time that you get on the field isn't consistent. I mean, to produce in those spots where it's like in and out, in and out, like it's very hard to do that. So the fact that he was getting an opportunity to consistently be in the lineup and that Buck Showalter had, had a lot of faith in him, you know, kind of like Robert Andino, who we talked to on the first episode of this podcast, where he kept inserting him in the lineup and Pierce just kept on producing. And if you don't have, like I said, guys like him and, and the, the Ryan Flaherty's and the Kelly Johnson's and Caleb Joseph's and, you know, all those different players that had a role in that team, it, it may not have allowed some of those other great exploits like Nelson Cruz to fully come through and allow you to get to the ALCS. I want to take fans back to this day. It was September the 16th, 2014, in Baltimore, Maryland, over 35,000 fans on hand on a Tuesday night uh, saw the Orioles beat the Blue Jays 8-2. to two. Now, the starting uh, matchup in that game was Drew Hutchinson of the Toronto Blue Jays against Ubaldo Jimenez of the Orioles. Now, Ubaldo had signed as a free agent uh, really as spring training was getting going in 2014. And his first year, as was his career at Baltimore, for being honest, was a struggle. But he did win that night. He pitched pretty well, five innings, two runs, six strikeouts. And then that Orioles locked down bullpen behind him. On this night, it was McFarland, O'Day, Andrew Miller, who was a deadline pickup and was sensational. And then Tommy Hunter uh, closed it out. And it was a party a lot of Orioles fans have been waiting for, uh, really, since 1997. I mean, 2012 was so special. And that was kind of the building process to this. But uh, what a night in downtown Baltimore. Incredible night in downtown Baltimore. And then they would have another one, you know, not too far down the road with the Delman Young game. And 
him producing in that spot that sends you to Detroit, as Steve pointed out in our conversation, the, the, the staff that was lights out for the Tigers then is still a, a trio that if you, you looked at it now, they would still be a pretty harrowing group that you had to face. And yet the Orioles were able to sweep them in three games. And then you move on to Kansas City, two teams with great bullpens. And although the Orioles had so many hard hit balls in that series, Pierce in, in particular, it just felt like that whenever you'd make great contact, it was at somebody or – the likes of Mike Moustakis was making some kind of a great play at third base, and then you would turn it into a, you know, a game where fifth inning, sixth inning, the Royals bring in all their different group of relievers, and it just didn't seem like it, and it just wasn't meant to be. But that was a special year for the Orioles that Orioles fans had waited so long for. They had all the pieces, and, and, I, and I find, Brett, that the things about teams that, that win World Series is you expect the good players to be good, but it's the role players who step up and do extraordinary things that define those World Series winning teams. And, and for that reason, it was my first one with the organization in 2014 when you saw the, the way that guys like Steve Pierce played. That had you believe in this might be the year that, that Birdland gets another World Series. That was definitely the sentiment all season long. And now let's chop it up. Let's look back at this magic moment with Steve Pierce. Well, right now, he's a guy that you want up there in this situation. Two aboard, two outs. And now the 0 1 pitch. Here's fly ball, right center. Pretty well hit on the run. Anthony goes way back there, way back there. Wave that baby. Bye bye. Pierce has done it. A three run homer. Orioles ahead, three to one. Well, it was a night to remember at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. It was a Tuesday, September 16th, 2014, and a rowdy crowd saw the Baltimore Orioles win the American League East, part of an 8-2 to two win over the Toronto Blue Jays. A big part of that team was Steve Pierce, who played around, for the, uh, played around the field and played around with the Orioles for several seasons, but had a monster year in 2014 as the Orioles went on to win 96 games swept the divisional round opponent of the Detroit Tigers and eventually lost in the American League Championship Series. But Steve Pierce joins us right now to reminisce about all of that. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you and your family are well. Thank you for having me, man. Thank you for having me. Look forward to talking about this. Well, Steve, take us through kind of the buildup. Because in the end, you know, the American League East is the toughest division in pro sports. But the Orioles kind of lapped the field. You know what I mean? It was not – there was nothing in doubt going into September 16th. It was just a matter of when. Oh, yeah, it sure was, man. We uh, we had such a good team, and people forgot about, like, all the injuries that we had also. You know, we had such a great uh, chemistry in the clubhouse, and we had this next man up mentality. And, you know, we lost – I mean, we lost, we lost Weeders. We lost Davis. We lost Machado. Um, you know, those were, those were key parts of the team. And, and you know, it's just whoever stepped up, like Caleb – or whoever just stepped up, they always seemed to uh, do the job. And, and we always – it was it was next man up, somebody new every single night, and it was just a fun season. You were certainly one of the guys that, that benefited from that next man up, getting a lot of opportunities to, to play every day. And you had the first blow of that game with the, the three-run homer. Uh, what do you remember when you walked into the batter's box for that, that first A-B against Hutchinson? Uh – you know, we, we had such a, such a big lead, so it wasn't like we were, uh, you know, kind of pressing going into that night. I think we – I don't know, we – it was one game to clinch in, like, uh, September 18th, I think you guys said. So, it was, a, it was it was a magical night, but it wasn't like one of those, you know, win or go home moments. So, it's like it was – at that time, I think we, we knew it was a matter of time that we were going to win the division. So, uh, but, you know, we were, we were hot. We were, we were hot as a pistol at that time, and, and it was only a matter of time that we knew we were going to take it down. Steve, tell me about the crowd that night at the ballpark and the buildup and obviously a lot of Seven Nation Army uh, throughout the course of that season and kind of just the, the, not only the volume of crowd, but the energy of the crowd. You've obviously played in some big moments and big spots and some big venues, but uh, tell us about that. Oh, man, it was, it was a – Magical night. Uh, it was fun, I and mean, the crowd was the crowd was rocking. And that was that was one thing about you know that year is 
is, uh, you know, we we're, were in such a tough division, to, you know, and, and when we were taking down, this crowd just kept getting bigger and bigger. And, and you know, when you talk about home field advantage, uh, you know, we felt that every single night. And that was just – that was huge for us uh, at that time. Was there a moment where you, you kind of knew it was over? I mean, Diaz had that big hit later on in the game, but – was there a moment where maybe you, you knew that, that it was kind of fully in the bag and over? Um, I don't know. You know, it was just, just one of those years and one of those teams that we had that it didn't really matter what the, the situation. We always knew we were going we to find a way to win. If we were winning, we knew we were going to win. If we were losing, it was a matter of time for us to come back and win. It's, we, just, we just had one of those things. We just always managed to uh, – find ways to get it done. And it was just one of the funnest uh, teams I've ever been a part of. You mentioned the guys that were out for a huge part of that season. I, I think Weeders went down on May 5th, and he was actually off to a monster start, the best start of his mm -hmm. career. Machado gets comes back late uh, and then gets hurt late, and then Davis had the suspension. I mean, you talk about three guys who have had these astronomical contracts in baseball, three guys who were stars at different points of their career, uh, two – to lose those guys, I mean, you still have a core group of, of really known guys, guys who've been in all-star games and stuff like that, the Joneses, the Hardys. But it was really the, you know, Cruz comes on this one-year deal in spring training of 14, and then you have this monster season. And, and it was really, I thought, guys like you over the course of that, uh, that run, particularly from 2012 through 16, who, who kind of were glue guys in the Buck Walter world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had uh, we had such a great team on the field, and what was best was our off the field. You know, we we always had fun in the clubhouse, and uh, you know, we always pulled for each other. And then you know, the new guys who stepped up, like you said, we just went down. Boom! Here comes Caleb Joseph, and and he was a machine back there. I mean, he he killed rally after rally for other teams, and you know, he's always just making you know just big big uh, defensive plays, throwing somebody out. You know, he. Uh, even Scope, you know, Scope was a rookie that year, I, I believe, and you know he was playing, you know, awesome defense with him and uh, JJ up the middle, and and it was just always we we took so much pressure off of the core group, you know, the you know the big superstars because you know we had so many new step in, and they just they fulfilled the role just just perfectly. When you you recorded that final out of the game, uh, I'm curious. What happened with the ball? Because you, you were the guy that you had the ball and then you're running over, everybody's, you know, dog piling and everything like that. Uh, what happened to the, the ball, the, the final out? Do you, do you have it with you or, or where did it end up going? Oh, I got it. <laughs> I have it. Uh -huh. me, and, uh, me and Hunter, because uh, Tommy, I think I remember was pitching and, uh, you know, I gave it to him and, you know, he gave it back to me and I said, how about, you know, we switch off for every couple of years, we keep giving it back to each other. Well, uh, it kind of fell apart, and uh, I kind of just still have it. So uh, that was definitely – it was a cool night, and, and it's, uh, you know, something that me and Tommy, we always talk about. Steve, you were 31 years old in 2014. You played a lot of games, both in the big leagues and minor leagues, uh, but it was, you know, not a point where you were an established player until that year. But could you appreciate the moment for Nick Markakis and Adam Jones, guys who have been with the club for so long through a lot of tough times, and it's hard for me to ever forget the look on those two guys after winning a division championship. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, man, Mark Higgins, man, he was a great player. You know, those guys, those guys built built the Orioles. You know, they, those were the um, the core guys. You know, they were there in the rough times, and and uh, you know when when we all came together in '14, you know, it was awesome that uh, that they were still there to you know to to see it through, and. Um, and man, those guys were such great teammates. They were they were awesome. They were awesome clubhouse guys. And, uh, wished them nothing but the best. You know, when when they left, it, uh, you know, Mark Akis obviously he left first. And, and uh, man, I I really enjoyed playing with him. He was he was a great guy and and a great teammate. How about Nelson Cruz? I mean, he comes over to the Orioles, most valuable Oriole that year. Definitely some. You know, maybe some people, you know, with some question marks, given what, you know, could kind of happen before he came to the team. But the production that he put up and just watching him every day, what was that like for you? Oh, it was awesome. 
it was it was awesome watching him and and he was another great guy you know it was he was a late sign in spring training we really didn't know what kind of guy we were getting we knew we could play ball but uh you know personality wise and uh you know he, we loved him the first day he came uh, the, the energy that he brought you know obviously you know he brought the the bat too but you know the energy in the clubhouse and uh, in his personality man he, he was so funny he, he gets everybody laughing and and uh and it's no wonder that almost every single team that he's on always finds a way to make it to the playoffs because you know he's just he's just a great dude great clubhouse guy he makes it baseball fun for everybody steve uh you went deep in the clinching game but i don't know how many people remember this you went deep twice the day after against the blue jays I don't know how late you guys were up or how early you guys were up the next day, but that's pretty impressive to go deep twice the day after a clincher. And by the way, that was also an Orioles win. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, we, we went out and we celebrated uh, after clinching and going out there the next day. It's uh, it, it was a little blurry, but um, <laughs> yeah, man, somehow to run into a couple of baseballs and, and uh, yeah, and found a way to get it done. But I, I know that was a tough night. <laughs> Not just me, but for everybody. <laughs> so you kind of fast forward to the, the ALDS that year. Delman Young has that that huge game uh, that, you know, he gets that big hit, and you guys are up 2-0 against the Tigers, and then you're, you're going to Detroit. Kind of what was the feeling of the team around that point? Because I, I'm sure you felt like – not only do we have a chance to, to sweep here, but we have a chance to, you know, possibly be going to a World Series at this point. Oh, for sure. Um, even the, the the pitchers that we faced, you know, playing Detroit, you know, we faced, uh, you know, it was Verlander, Scherzer, and then Price. You know, that's a pretty lethal, uh, you know, that that was, what, about six years ago? I mean, yeah, that's still a lethal pitching staff right now. You know, that was, um, you know, to do what we did against those guys, um, you, you know, just the team that we had, the, the way that we were able to just always – no matter what the point was in the game, that we could always find ways to win if we were down. Uh, there was no, there was no question that that we were that we were um, that we were going to go to a World Series that year. We we all felt it, and you know, fortunately, we faced a, an even hotter team in the Kansas City Royals because no matter what they did, they always found a way to get that key hit or that key run at at every crucial time. And and uh, you know, they were kind of, you know, they were they were on the same track that we were, you know. They were hot, but they were just, or we were hot. They were hot, but they just found a way to get done. I want to ask you about this because I saw every one of those ALCS games up close, and uh, it was frustrating uh, as someone uh, who obviously was a lifelong Orioles fan uh, watching it. Yes, it was a four-game sweep. Uh, the series, the Orioles had a great bullpen. The Royals had a great bullpen, and you know leads were just critical in all this. I, I know by the numbers, you did not have. A good series, but I distinctly remember you putting so many balls on the screws that seemed mm -hmm. to go right to Kansas City defenders. And then looking back, and I'm not the most well versed in advanced metrics, but I did see a number as far as hard hit balls. The Orioles had a much better average than the Kansas City Royals in that series, and, and that's just the reality of it. But you, in particular, stood out to me as someone who may have hit, you know, four, five, six balls on the screws that went right into the gloves of Kansas City defenders. Yeah, it was you know it was really frustrating too because you know I, I I felt really good at the plate and and I just kept looking up at the scoreboard. I'm like, man, I'm hitting, I think one for fifteen, one for sixteen, something like that. And I'm like, man, I'm I feel really good at the plate here. I'm just not getting anything to fall. And uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely frustrating. And you know, it just seems like you know we were doing stuff like that, and and then they would have a runner on third first and third and they just hit a slow rolling ground ball where we couldn't get the double play turned or they just a two out jam shot that just fell over everybody and we just it just it just constantly kept happening for those guys and, and we couldn't get it done not take anything away from Kansas City you know they were a great team they were a hot team but but uh but playing in that series was definitely a frustrating series especially for everything that we were accomplishing and and uh just to have it end that the way that it did was kind of very frustrating when you still look at the season as a whole, though, you know, 14 was a career year for you. You, you got over 100 games, home runs, RBIs, lots of opportunities to play. Was that what the productivity came down to was an opportunity to be in the lineup pretty much every day? I mean, usually in different spots across the, the, the field, but at the same time, 
was it that everyday opportunity that kind of allowed you to put that season together? For sure. Um, you know, uh, it's all about just taking advantage of, of any kind of opportunity. And, you know, when Chris Davis went down, it, it was, uh, you know, I had my chance to, I don't know if you guys remember, I got released that year uh, from the Orioles. And, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to go to other places, but we didn't have another first baseman on the roster. So that was my, my decision to come back to play for the Orioles was the fact that there was everyday uh, playing opportunity for me. And, and, uh, and I knew this was, that, that would have been a, a chance for me to do that. So um, definitely playing every single day definitely helps, you know, instead of getting those sporadic at bats, you know, every now and again, it's just those Sunday morning starts, those late inning at bats off relievers, you know, that's, it's very tough to play that way. Steve, I know, obviously, you had great success with the Red Sox, won a World Series, won a World Series MVP. But just looking back at that 2014 campaign, along the lines of what Jeff said, the, the chemistry of the ball club, uh, just being a part of something like the Delman Young double where you came home on to break oh. a long drought of, of not winning an, um, an AL East for an organization that has much prize the Orioles. Just t- t- where is this rank for you on a personal level? Well, it's definitely, you know, it, it's it's in my, my top, you know, memories that I'll ever have. Um, you know, that, that Delman Young double, I mean, that that was loud. That was one of the best moments of my career was, was that was that double that, that he hit. Um, you know, especially, you know, we were down that game. Uh, and then it was just, uh, you know, just another – you know, part of what the Orioles did, we found ways to come back and win, and to have to do it in that atmosphere uh, was incredible. I mean, it was it was so loud. I mean, my ears were popping when I was running around third base. You know, it was you couldn't hear yourself think. I mean, that the, it you know I must have watched the replay of that you know a hundred times, and you just see the you know the the screen just you know shaking, just how loud it was. And you just see people from across the street, you know, they're on top of the buildings and the, the whole city was electric. I mean, I got chill bumps just thinking about it. I mean, that was, <laughs> it was such a cool moment. And, uh, and I'll never forget it. I will, I, I mean, that, that's one of my highlights that I'll, I'll, I relive all the time. For you, uh, you're one of the rare players out there that um, I think I, I saw this recently. You were one of only uh, six major league players to play uh, for every team in a division. And as Brett talked about, like the American League East is one of the toughest divisions in all of major league sports. It doesn't matter uh, where you go. Um, did you find it kind of humorous just how much time that you you spent in the AL East and just going from ballpark to ballpark and, and how it always seemed like you came back to to an AL East team? Yeah, you know, one of, one of the things I always tell everybody was, you know, when I kept going to a new team, I was, I was like, well, I know all these guys. So the, really the – I really just had to learn. When I went to a new team, whether it was the Rays or Toronto or Red Sox, it was like, well, I played against these guys forever. So I, I really just have to know their personalities now because I, I knew how they were as a ball player. Because, like, you know, playing first base, you talk to everybody. And uh, so the transition was always easy when I went to every single team. And that's, that's what was uh, – it always made it easy for me. You know, just going to a new team, it's being like, all right, hey, man, what's up? All right, yeah, yeah, how to, uh, all right, what's, what are you all about? You know, it's just, just kind of learning new personality. So it was, it was always really easy because the transition, or the transition was always easy. Not that Orioles fans necessarily care too much about this one, but you did win a World Series MVP, kind of noteworthy. Where is that trophy kept up in the Pierce household? Oh, yo, the, the tro- oh, man, that's, uh, that's on my mantle and uh, in my man cave. Uh, that's back of the house. I, I would have it out here, but I'm obviously not, I'm not at my house right now. But um, yeah, that that was that, <laughs> that's uh you know that that's the award that you want to win. Yeah, that's the award you dream about uh, your whole life. So you know, I take uh, so much pride in that award. You also, when you you win a World Series MVP, I mean Chevrolet, I think gave you a truck. Like, do you drive the truck around at all, or do you do anything with that? Uh, I don't. My dad does. I, I gave it to <laughs> nice. him. Nice. And he loves it. I, I love. I love when he drives it. Um, it you know, I, I bought a truck. You know, uh, the year before, 
And, uh, you know, when I won the World Series and I saw how nice the truck was, I was kind of upset. I was like, man, I just I just bought myself a truck. If I would have known I was going to win a truck, I would have I held out for a year. So, uh, yeah, my dad, my dad loved it. And, you know, it was it was awesome for me to give it to him. Well, Steve, we appreciate your time talking about those 2014 uh, Orioles, a team that won a division title, uh, just energized uh, all, uh, all Orioles fans, but really the city. And uh, what a couple of just incredible moments that you're including the day the Orioles won the American League East with a win over the Blue Jays, a game you went deep in. And then again, you hit those two home runs the next day, uh, which was really impressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, those hurt more than more than uh, than most of them, I'll tell you that. But but it was fun. It was fun season, fun team. It, it was magical. Uh yeah, I mean that, that those the Orioles fans they, they were they were so crazy that year. They, they, it was awesome showing up to the park. I remember there was there were rain delays and and you just heard heard that just the place just rocking. And uh, you know when you when you hear about home field advantage, you know Camden Yards was you know during 2014 was definitely we definitely had that home field advantage. I'll tell you that. Steve, thank you so much. Uh, be healthy and well to you and your family. Thank you. Hey, you guys too. You know, stay safe. All right. See, show off the shirt, Steve. Hey, here we go. Yeah, that is that is awesome. That's awesome. Make Fantastic. sure we get that in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fun, fun, fun. Is that fun. the shirt they gave you right after? I believe it is. I still think That's it is. Awesome. Still might even, that is so still cool. I might even smell like champagne a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> how did they decide, by the way, Steve, who got the who played the next day? Like how did because there's expanded rosters. How did uh, Buck decide that? Was it just like Steve, you're playing? Yeah, I was. I was kind of actually angry about it too. <laughs> when I saw the lineup, it was you know everybody had a day off except I think it was like me and Hardy were like the only two guys. I think that, that I don't. Know, I think it was me and Hardy were the only two guys in the lineup that were that were starters. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. whatever. You know, I hit two home runs. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would have hated it a lot more if I would have wore like an 0 for 4 with a couple of strikeouts. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. amazing. You went deep twice in that game. And, and, and I think the Orioles won like 6-1 or 8 nothing or something. Yeah. Yeah. Was, we, uh, we kept our foot on the gas pedal. Yeah. That's awesome, Steve. Well, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, yeah. thanks for having me, guys. Well, Jeff, that's Steve Pierce. And I love the fact he was wearing his ALE shirt. I think – we can get we can become cynical about these ball players uh, in in some way, which is unfortunate. But for a guy like Steve Pierce, you could sense it. That team, those moments, they meant so much to him. I mean, we're now talking about six years later, and he still has this shirt he was wearing that night, the one he celebrated in, uh, which I thought was just cool. And it says a lot, really, what these moments really mean to them as people. If you go back into the, the conversation, you, you pointed out that he was, he was wearing the shirt and he was saying that it, it still kind of smells of champagne. He was like, I, this was the actual shirt that he received when the Orioles won the division and they, they threw him the shirt. And, uh, but it was, it was so, so cool to see that. And uh, I, I respect Steve Pierce for how he continued to stick with it. And he just took whatever role that he was assigned, wherever they needed him to play, whatever was asked of him, he just went about his business and did it. It would have been easy for somebody that, you know, had bounced around with the Pirates for, for so long and had jumped from team to team and the number of transactions. I mean, you even go to the, the very end and how he was with Toronto and then he goes over to the Red Sox and it's just like, okay, it's like, well, my, my wife and family finally gets here. Now we got to move again. Um, but he just accepted whatever assignment that he was given. He made the most of it uh, throughout his career and he was big for the Orioles. He was big in, in 2018 where he was World Series MVP. And those are the guys that, that you, you root for. It's it's like the, the superstars you expect stuff from and the all-stars you, you expect them to be good. But when somebody stays around the game for as long as guys like Steve Pierce did, you know, parts of 13 years in the big leagues, they're the ones that you find yourself rooting the most for. You mentioned that Steve said his shirt still may have smelled like champagne. I, I do recall the voice of the Orioles at the time, uh, my uh, friend Joe Angel said in his radio call, which was tremendous, champagne for everybody. And that's actually what he said in his call. So I think Steve and others really took advantage of it. For me, I remember it well. Uh, at the time, I was uh, in the Orioles locker room 
uh, doing post-game interviews on radio, uh, on the Orioles radio network. And it was as celebratory as I've, and I've been in some losing locker rooms and I've been in some winning locker rooms across a variety of sports. Uh, the celebration that night in that clubhouse was, was something else. I even recall a player or two coming over and putting some liquid on, on my head. Uh, but it was, <laughs> it was something else. And then we had a, kind of go back on the radio for hours and hours. And it's one of those days where you really obviously embrace everything that's coming to you because we've all seen uh, the other side of it. And then, uh, you know, we all had to get up early the next day and, and, and do our, our radio and television hits and, and do everything that was, uh, you know, in reaction to it. And it, Baltimore just didn't care. I mean, it was so energized. I mean, they opened up the ballpark that night and it was 35,000. It, it felt like 45,000. And uh, it was a Tuesday night, you know, kids at school early next day. We were already middle September. And uh, it was just so loud. I mean, people did not want to leave the ballpark. They did not want to leave. Adam Jones took a lap around the field. Nick Markakis, I just remember this look of, of shock on his face. I mean, this is a guy drafted and developed by the club. And you just saw him take in the moment. Nick is as stoic as they come. Uh, but in this moment, you, you saw the emotion on his face. It was something you had to see. I think some of the things that I remember about that that night were, of course, the, the celebration and Joe Angel's call, but the number of pies that, you know, Adam Adam oh, Jones, yeah. you know, pieing Nick Marquez is Adam Jones pieing a fan. I mean, it was the definition of a celebration for a place that had been waiting so long and, and felt like this group was, was going to be the, the group that could finally do it. And after, you know, you'd started to gradually get closer and closer, you eventually got all the different pieces that were – that were there that was able to get a run to the ALCS. And uh, my question to you, Brett, is um, were, were those clothes that you had ruined from all that all that champagne I'm sure you got on you in, uh, the, uh, a, in the clubhouse after the game? Good question. I actually brought a change of clothes to the ballpark That's smart. that night. That's smart. And uh, in Radio 2 at Camden Yards, which is right next to uh, where one day you'll be calling a lot of Orioles games on the radio, Jeff, uh, next to Radio 1, which is where I had my uh, post-game booth set up. I had a change of clothes. I put on a new – uh, shirt. I put on all, some new clothes. I was drenched. I was completely drenched and uh, I was prepared for it, which I think was smart. You know, other people were trying to prep me. I, I'd been around the 2012 club a lot, uh, but they didn't have a home uh, celebration like that. And I, I covered that team closely, but they didn't have that moment in a clubhouse. But people were saying, you know, put your, your microphone and your, your phone in, in plastic, put it in a Ziploc bag, do all these things. And I try to do some of that uh, best I could, but it was one of those things where you just kind of had to roll with it. But I did try and prepare. Uh, that is the truth. By the way, if people forgot, we mentioned Steve Pearson a home run that game. A guy by the name of Jimmy Paredes hit a home run off Drew Hutchinson in the second inning. Paredes was one of those, you know, pickups where it kind of just worked again. Alejandro Deaza tripled, a three-run triple in that game. Nick Markakis led off, got on base a few times, you might expect. Also scored a couple runs. Uh, Nelson Cruz was your DH. J.J. Hardy was your shortstop. Uh, Ryan Flaherty started that game at second. And also catcher Nick Hundley, who's had a very good career. Uh, he was a pickup in the season after the Weeders injury. He and Caleb Joseph basically split time behind the plate. So it was uh, really a team in that sentiment. 96 wins. You, you may never hear this again. I mean, they ran away with the American League East. If it was a horse race, you know, this thing was over at the top of the stretch. It was, and the the way that they just kept getting production and it kept building upon itself. I mean, th there was a time where, I mean, early on in the years, they were trying to work some things out. Uh, but once you, you started getting to June and July, I mean, June was a really good month. It was a great month for Steve Pierce if you went back and and looked at the numbers and 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 what he was able to put together. And Nelson Cruz had a had a great June as well, and was just putting up absurd numbers immediately, showing the Orioles. Uh, why they they took the chance, brought him on board, and he produced in, in a major major way for that team. Uh, but once you get into July, like you said, it was they were they were lapping people. I mean, there was there was no doubt that this was the Orioles division. They had firm control of it. They go to the postseason, they sweep the Tigers, and and suddenly you you run into the Royals. But you know, as much magic as the Orioles had going for them, the Royals were just in one of those years where it was the the same kind of kind of situation, and you know everything just just came together for them as it was coming together for the Orioles. And Jeff, you'll remember this, and you you have to remind me of it. Didn't the Royals 
need a miracle to win their wild card game against Oakland, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. That they, they needed a miracle to even advance to that point. I don't want to take anything away from Kansas City because uh, they went on to win the pennant and then they won the World Series the next year. I mean, they were totally legitimate. They played a very fascinating style of baseball. Their bullpen obviously was perfect for the postseason. But uh, didn't they need a miracle to, to win that wild card game? I have to go look back at the box score to see exactly how it happened, but I believe they won it on a walk-off. Uh, don't quote me on this because I don't have it in front of me. I think it might have been Salvador Perez who had a walk-off possibly right. in that game. So maybe you can can check that for me. But, I mean, they, they kind of the, – the Royal style has always been pitching and defense and just scoring – uh, enough runs uh, if you if you go uh, all the way you know back in time you know earlier on that's kind of the way that the Orioles played you know when they they kind of had their their first wave of strength uh, but you play in that massive ballpark at, at Kauffman Stadium and when you could turn things over to that bullpen where it was just it was like you'd see the guys that were coming in it was fast faster and fastest yeah no and mystery if you, if you just got four to five innings out of your starting pitcher, and you could give it over to that group, you had a pretty good sense that you're going to be able to win the game. And then whenever the Orioles, like we talked about, hit something hard, uh, seemed like they had any momentum, there was the Royals' defense to make a big play. And, and the reality is, and I don't want to harp on this too much, but you're getting me going here, Jeff. Uh, the reality <laughs> is uh, the Orioles' bullpen, I would argue, that year was deeper, deeper by having six, seven guys over the course of 162 you could turn to. But in a playoff format with the built-in off days, it allows you to ride two, three, four guys every single game. And that's a little different. I mean, listen, the Orioles had some lockdown guys in their bullpen, Britton, O'Day, Miller. I mean, they could have, you know, run out any one of those guys and it would have been just as dominant. But it was about getting a lead and, uh, you know, a play here, play there. Uh, and they just weren't able uh, to come up with that one or two big hits you needed to jump out in front of it and to make it their bullpen game. And um, that's the way it breaks. I mean, every one of those games was hyper competitive, really close. And it was four games that went the Kansas City Royals way. But, uh, Jeff, that was a lot of fun uh, looking back at this magic moment. Steve Pierce is a, a really interesting baseball guy, just a character and really a glue guy on that 2014 Orioles club. So that was a lot of fun. It was a blast. And I love to, to hear how he and um... – Tommy Hunter continued to, to share that, that, that baseball cool. from the from the final out. Like, Hunter was on the mound for it, hit it to Steve Pierce at first base, steps on first base. Because sometimes you, you never know what happens to the ball. Like, do you keep it? Does it get lost in a dog pile? Do you throw it into the stands and a fan gets it? Like, like what ultimately happens to the baseball? It's like one of the, the funnier things that can that can happen out there. But, but Pierce still has got it, and he, he kind of trades it off with Tommy Hunter. Should it be on display somewhere in the warehouse right now or wherever? Yeah, you would think uh, that's where that ball would be. But good for Steve and Tommy to corral that thing. Uh, but that does it for this episode of Magic Moments. We can't wait to talk to you again soon.